Hey, hey, everyone. Welcome to Unique Ways with Thomas Gerard and Audio Podcast. We've got a super awesome guest today. Um, she believes education is pivotal to creating change in the global supply chain and interdisciplinary env environmental and social sustainability professional focused on textiles and leather apparel industries. Her expertise lies in facilitating businesses to analyze their dynamic capabilities and reallocate resources to push forward circularity in product and processes in their supply chains. Join me in welcoming Maranisha Mulali. Welcome, Maranisha. Hi, Thomas. Thanks for having me. You ready for 20 questions? I'm ready. Yeah, shoot. Okay, here we go. Question one. Tell me a little bit more about yourself. What do you do? Okay, so um, uh, in a nutshell, what I do at the moment uh, is I'm a, a lecturer at the Amsterdam Fashion Institute uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and uh, what I teach is uh, sustainability uh, across the board. So sustainability all the way from the first year to, to the fourth year. That means that I have entry level uh, students, but I also uh, have uh, thesis students. I haven't always been uh, a lecturer. Um, I actually come, uh, I, I come from the industry. I do have an industry uh, background um, and I have about uh, 20 years um, experience in uh, sustainable strategies uh, in corporate companies, but also in uh, SMEs and small medium uh, enterprises. Um, and um, how I got into this was, um, uh, well, actually, I, I live in the Netherlands, uh, but originally I'm uh, from South Africa and my forefathers are from India. And uh, you could say that growing up, uh, we never threw anything away and uh, there was very little waste in our house. And as I was growing up, I realized that uh, the, 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 the traditional wear, uh, traditional clothes that my grandmother had did not really suit my modern lifestyle. So I would use the fabric to upcycle them. Uh, into clothes that uh, that I wanted or that suited me. And so that was, I would say that was the beginning, but that was when I was 15. Uh, so that's quite a, quite a long time ago, that's 35 years ago. And from that, it uh, gradually and organically grew into something uh, that I do today. So over a 35 year span, I, uh, I think that I kind of grew into something that I really love and that is, trying to teach students today what it means to be sustainable, what sustainability means, what is the definition of that? There are so many definitions, but what does it mean to each individual and how can you, uh, how can you engage with sustainability for the future um, uh, while looking at yourself and what you want to do? So I, yeah, I think in a nutshell, I would say that's what I do. Uh, and uh, normally, uh, I, I would say also, a lot of people um, uh, would separate their personal and their uh, private lives, either professional and private lives. But for me, it's very integrated. So being in sustainability, uh, it, it's not just my job. It's something that I love, something that I think about. I also really live in a place that... Uh, that uh, that engages with sustainability. The Netherlands is uh, in general quite sustainable. Mm -hmm. So I would say that it's it's really integrated into my life. Yeah, okay, that's me in a nutshell. Great, that's awesome. Um, just a note for our audience, uh, Marinisha and I met in New Delhi about 10 years ago now. Um, we were both mm -hmm. lecturers at a small design school there and she was uh, very bold about her ideas with sustainability. And I think it's super cool that I'm in Canada and uh, and Marinisha is in the Netherlands and we're able to to connect in this way. Indeed, that's really wonderful, and it's it's nice that you you bring up uh, New Delhi because um, it was my uh, my jump into into the teaching world actually, and also teaching sustainability because before that I worked in industry. And I did workshops for, for businesses as well, but really teaching the new generation. That was indeed when I when I started teaching in New Delhi with you. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's a it's a great uh, so we've come full circle. That's a lovely lovely point to make. Yeah. Sure. Okay, number two. What's a key piece of knowledge that makes you different? Um. 
gosh, uh, I think that we are, most of us are more alike than we are different, but I would say that uh, in, in the realm of, uh, of being professional, I have quite a diverse uh, background um, and quite an inclusive background. So I, I mentioned it earlier on that I'm from South Africa, but I have an Indian, uh, eth I'm ethnically Indian. I grew up in South Africa, but I've lived most of my life now, 29 years uh, in Europe, in the Netherlands. And I think what makes me different is uh, I'm able to, uh, well, I hope, I think I'm able to relate to and understand that sustainability means different things to different cultures in the world. Uh, I think one of the key points of uh, pushing sustainability forward for uh, you know, uh, for, for the global community is also understanding what that means to, to different cultures. Um, and it's something that I grew into, even though, of course, I, I know what my background is, uh, but being educated in Europe and starting my career in Europe, when I started, I also thought, well, this is the way to do it until I actually moved to India and realized, well, no, you know, it can be done differently. So I think the key piece of knowledge that makes me different in my job is being able to understand and to see students and to understand their different perspectives. So not, not just from a sustainability perspective, but also from you know, a design perspective, a management perspective, and also a branding perspective. So you know, these are the three uh, directions we have at the school that I, at the university that I teach. And I think that's very important to, um, to also understand and see students for who they are, where they come from, and what do they bring to the table. That's great. You know, um, just early on in that bit, you uh, you mentioned inclusion, and I think that's a, a great kind of topic, you know, the idea of including everybody and more. Um, we have a guest coming on, uh, Dr. Ron Wakari, who, uh, who wrote a book about um, more than human um, a more than human world, and um, I think uh, I think that kind of topic is really um, really a, a good focus these days. Um, number three, why this of all things? Why do you do what you do? Oh gosh, why this of all things? Because when I started uh, in this industry, um, I, I well, I, as I said, I the the I, uh, fabric and textiles it's, it's part of my my makeup is a little bit of in my DNA. It's in my culture. I, I loved it. We always had a lot of beautiful fabric in our house. And uh, um, so I wanted to, um, I, I wanted to be uh, in textiles and I wanted to be in this industry. And when I did my bachelor's uh, in the Netherlands and I, uh, in the second year, uh, we had um, a, a talk, we had a, a guest lecture from the clean clothes campaign. And uh, in that lecture, I realized that our industry was not just, uh, it was not just an industry that was full of pollution, but it was an industry that was also stuck in colonialism and also an industry that was, uh, that, that was, that was mistreating people. And I thought, well, either I can step out and do something else or I can stay and I can try to change it. And so, at that point, I made a decision that if I stay in this industry, that my job and, and what I was going to bring to the industry was change. So that's what I've been trying to do to create some change. And I'm not the only person, I'm, I have a lot of colleagues, I have people all around the world, and I love it when I meet other people that want to do the same. So for me, it was not about giving up an industry that I liked or giving up a passion that I liked, but actually trying to change it uh, for good. And um, now that I, uh, I work a lot less in the industry, I feel that it's also my job to transfer the knowledge that I do have to the next industry. So this is why I do what I do now, which is lecturing, because I love that the next generation can probably do a lot better than me. And I hope that I can give them what I have so that they can actually, you know, they, I, I just, I wanna pass the torch. I remember first hearing about sustainability really early on, but that wasn't in an industrial design context. I really wanted to study industrial design. Um, but you're in a fashion context, aren't you? Yes, yes, absolutely. Fashion and textiles, apparel. 
So, you know, everything from uh, uh, every, everything from textiles, leather, jewelry, um, uh, accessories, uh, generally apparel. And it has been quite a hard road for, for this industry because uh, it's not necessarily an industry that wants to change. It's a, uh, this is a, this is a, 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 a trillion dollar uh, industry. And uh, it's an industry that makes an enormous amount of money. 80% of this, uh, of this industry is run by women generally in the entire value chain, but also um, uh, underpaid, no gender equality, uh, you know, uh, no, um, uh, uh, no, 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 uh, uh, there's no equal rights. There's, there's a big pay gap, you know. Um, so there's a lot of problems uh, in the industry, and it's and even now, you know, we've been working this industry for such a long time. Um, myself, I've been working in it for 22 years, um, and I have to say that even I think that you know change is very slow. But um, yeah, that it, it maybe this is a this is a subject for another time. But the problem is that in business, it's always about money first. So and and that's how businesses run, of course. You know, so it's taking a lot of time, and it's a very slow process in fashion. But uh, there is still a little bit of improvement, and and that's kind of where I fit in. I want to see progress, and I want to look towards the future. I love that. That segues very well into number four, which uh, is what does your future look like? Mm. Right. My personal future, I would say, looks like, um, let me see, I think the word I would use is balance uh, for my future. And what that means is that I want to create or see more balance between my um, my personal life and my work life. Um, and what I would like to see in the industry or rather for myself as my future is I would like to see myself be able to um, do a lot more research. Uh, I'm really looking at more research and also research into different technologies and how those technologies uh, could help or could uh, be advantageous uh, for uh, subjects like social sustainability uh, uh, in, uh, in our industry. So I'm looking towards doing a lot more research and uh, keeping the ball uh, rolling and not really stopping. So I, I, want to, I, I want to have a lot more knowledge and I think that, uh, that that's where I want to be, along with my students. You know, my students are, uh, uh, they, they work hard and they're constantly researching. And so I thought, well, you know, they're, that's what they are doing and, and, and I need to do that as well. And so I've been thinking recently about doing a lot more research into uh, technologies like blockchain technologies or artificial intelligence, for example. Um, and how does that, uh, how does that uh, you know, uh, match up with, with fashion and what can that do in fashion? How can they be, um, how can they be drivers for a more sustainable uh, future in fashion. Great, I love that. Um, you're in the Netherlands and that makes number five really nice. The question is, let's talk about location. Mm -hmm. How does the notion of place play into what you do? Gosh, I think uh, quite heavily. It, it really does play quite heavily into it. I've, uh, um, there's a lot of amazing things about the Netherlands and one of the reasons I'm here is not just because I I've assimilated well or I fit into the culture, but I also feel that it is a place that really encourages the, this subject of sustainability. Uh, now, um, one of the disadvantages of, uh, of living in Northwestern Europe is that initially it was a place where, uh, where we thought, well, you know, it's our way or the highway. So for example, when I worked in the industry, uh, companies, brands, producers that I worked for, you know, would set out a code of conduct and say, well, this is how we want it. And if you don't do it like this, then we're not going to work with you. But I think that over the years, we're trying to uh, grow and we're trying to, you know, also companies here are understanding, ah, this is not the way to go. We need to understand each other. This is a lot more complicated than my way or the highway. So what I like about living in a place like this is that, you know, uh, as arrogant as the North, northwest of the global north is 
I think there's always space to learn and at least there's always indeed the notion of, uh, okay, we haven't been doing it right. How can we change that? And so even I feel living in Amsterdam or living near Amsterdam, I do actually feel, um, I feel that pull quite strongly, you know, especially that pull towards diversity and inclusivity and certainly in the industry I am and also at the university that I am in, uh, there's a huge pull towards diversity, inclusivity, and, and this falls under sustainability as well, you know, so having a sustainable life, having a sustainable industry also means being sustainable with people, uh, with the planet, and also with the way you make money. Um, and I think that that plays a huge role. And the reason I say that is because I've just been uh, to visit uh, my uh, family in South Africa, and I haven't been there for quite a few years due to COVID and um, things like that. And what I realize is that when I'm there, there are some, it's a beautiful place I love visiting. But what I realize is that as much as I, there are elements that I love about South Africa, um, I think that the structure, the infrastructure, uh, and I'm talking about me personally, by the way, the infrastructure doesn't help me um, uh, go forward with, uh, with my ideologies and how I want to, or how I want my future to look like. So I think that, you know, place does play quite a big role in, um, uh, in what you do. Uh, I mean, on the other hand, I have friends that are designers there and have been for the last 30 years. They work very sustainably and they do it in their own way and it fits them. But because I'm in uh, education and I'm in research, I think that this is where I have the biggest platform to, uh, to do what I want to do. That's great. Um, one of our first guests, Mayor, who's a podcast host, um, came to us from Vancouver, but um, spoke about um, if, if there was one other place he would like to live, it would be the Netherlands. And it sounds yeah. like there's so much depth in that kind of choice of place. Um, it's, I'm, I'm super excited to, uh, to hear about it in this way. Um, number six, if you had to start from scratch, what advice would you give your former younger self? I think that the advice I would give my uh, younger self is, um, I thought about this actually some uh, a, a few years ago, and uh, I'm not even sure that I would take that advice, you know, because when I was thinking about this, um, so I, I did a degree in uh, fashion, and then later on, I did my master's, um, and I did a research master in uh, sustainability, so I went back to science. And when I was doing this research master, I kept thinking, oh, if only if I was 15 again, then I would work so much harder in, um, uh, in physics and chemistry and you know the natural sciences that I had at school. But the thing is, when I was 15, all I wanted to do was be creative. So I'm not even sure that I would take that advice, but I guess that uh, based on what I do now, I would probably say, pay a bit more attention in class because you can do it. It's not that. It's not as uh, as difficult as you thought it would be. And you know, you can also be creative um, in the natural sciences. Uh, because I thought, of course, creativity was something uh, far removed from what I'm doing now. And uh, of course, later on, I realized that there's creativity in everything that you do. So I would probably also say, you know, be a bit more open uh, to exploring those possibilities. That's super um, inspiring and a trigger for me. I, I just finished an MA here in Vancouver, and um, yeah. and you know I was looking at your LinkedIn profile, um, how you did your master's and where you did it, and how that shaped your career trajectory, and that was super inspiring for me. I saw that as a kind of a, a beacon for me as well. Oh, thank you, Thomas. My pleasure. Um, number seven. What does a day in your life look like? Ah, well, not as ex exciting as uh, you would think, because um, I think that we all have similar days, you know, we, we get up, we, uh, um, we, we go to work, and, uh, you know, if you're in a relationship or you have children, I don't have children, but uh, I do have a relationship, 
it's, it's a kind of, you know, my, my day is like anybody else's. It's as exciting and as boring as everybody else's. But generally, I have a four day week in which I teach. So I get up, I have an hour and 50 minutes commute uh, uh, to, uh, to Amsterdam because I'm living near the forest now. Uh, but generally what I try to do is I, I work on the train. Uh, I like to be efficient, as efficient as possible. Uh, I teach in Amsterdam and, um, and I do the same thing on the way back. And that's, that's a, a weekday for me. And when I come home, I, I don't actually do any work. So when I come home, I'm home and I'm present at home. Uh, and in the week uh, and in the weekends, um, I like to hang out with my, uh, with my husband and uh, we just recently started getting into to gardening. And this is also part of, you know, being present where you are. And of course, we love to travel, but um, we also think that it's, it's, it's very valid to kind of look around you and, and, and see what you can get out without traveling. You know, we, we hardly ever use the car, for example. So I always try to use public transport. It's also part of the whole sustainability you know, it's, it's living out a sustainable lifestyle as well. So we try to be very local and we try to do as much as possible around us. And um, um, I do love to have a coffee in the morning. So that's something I really love. And I also really love cooking a meal in the evening. So that's basically my day. I start with coffee and I end it with cooking a meal. I get the feeling that you you really kind of grasp this idea of of your day in the life. A lot of people struggle with how to answer that and and struggle with being too work oriented. It sounds like um, whether it's work oriented or not, you definitely um, have a good answer for that one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I like the good things in life, you know. I mean, I, I work hard, but I, I also just want to. I, 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 I tell you what it is. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if it's part of your question, but uh, it took me a very long time uh, to find somebody that I really love hanging out with. And when I found him, I realized that uh, work is there. I love work, but I also really love hanging out with this guy who loves to play the guitar in the evening. And so when I have a chance, I just, that's what I want to do. And so that makes it very easy. It's, it's not, it's just, a, I, didn't, I don't even have to choose. It's not a struggle. It's just, this is work. I love work, but I also love doing this. I love hanging out in the garden. I love listening to him play the guitar. And, um, and I think that maybe that indeed, you're right. It does create balance. But um, yeah, I'm, that does make me happy having this balance. Perfect. Okay. Number eight, lifelong learning is a popular topic these days. How do you stay up to date? Well, I'm very lucky uh, in that I uh, don't have a choice in staying up to date because I'm teaching and I teach 18, 19, 20, 22 year olds, and they are so on the money that uh, it's not possible to walk into a classroom anymore without being up to date on your knowledge and really current knowledge. Uh, so I do, uh, I have to be honest and say that I learn a lot from them, platforms that they use. It's really an, an exchange of knowledge. Um, I still do my own research, of course. Um, and I learn a lot from students that are doing their final thesis because, of course, they, they are also coming, uh, coming up with great subjects that they want to research. So um, I'm really in, I find a very, very... Um, advantageous position in that I don't have to work or force myself to stay up to date. It's so organic and I'm learning every day just in, a, in the classroom itself. And of course my own research. Um, but I would say that when you talk, when I, when I think about um, staying current uh, with this generation, I think I learned the most from them. I can really relate to that, you know, in my role as an educator, I definitely learned so much from my students and that's a hugely um, rewarding part of teaching. Yeah. Um, number nine, um, what tools do you use? Are you a digital nomad? Do you use pen and paper? Uh, no, I'm, I would say I'm a digital nomad and I think that this has become more prevalent, uh, especially during COVID because I taught online for two years. Uh, and I mean really uh, predominantly uh, online. Um, and uh, that was quite interesting because 
teaching is is obviously so interactive and it's face to face and all of a sudden we had to go online and and indeed we started using different platforms different tools um, different methods of communicating things like design and <clears throat> and information so I would say that I'm a I'm a digital nomad uh, when we are in the classroom uh, we do try I do try now of course to uh, to do some uh, analog work, but I myself, I prefer, I prefer the digital world because also I can transfer the information, you know? So what I like to do, for example, also is that when I have information, I want to be able to transfer that. And the easiest way to do that is digitally. And I think it's the future anyway. It's, it's not possible to really, in my opinion, it's not possible to teach in my industry also without uh, understanding that you know we are we are we are in a digital world great okay we're halfway there number 10 and you mm. answered this a little bit already but um the question is how do you deal with work-life balance oh yeah and in, in a nutshell and 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 really short i i'm very very strict about uh, my my private time i'm very strict about my holidays and uh uh, in, in very uh, extenuating circumstances, I might every now and then do something out of those hours, but I do believe that the evenings and the weekends are, are mine. And I also find I'm a, I'm a better teacher uh, on a Monday if I've had a, if I've had a good, good rest. So um, I, I also try to do some sport, which is very important for me on the weekends because I really like to do that. Um, and as I said before, I live in the forest, near the forest, so I really like to go for a walk in the forest. And that also started during COVID, so that's something I still do. Um, but uh, I think it's very, very important for everybody. And also very, I think you can only maintain a sustainable work life if you have a sustainable, um, if you have a sustainable personal life as well. Great. Um, number 11, if you weren't doing what you do now, what would you be doing? I think that I would probably uh, definitely be working with clothing, but it would be uh, in another creative industry. Uh, what a lot of people don't know about me is that my very, very first degree was theater and costume design in South Africa uh, before I even started traveling or moved to Europe. This was what I did in South Africa, and I worked uh, at one of the national theatres in South Africa as a stage manager, and it will always remain a passion. Uh, so the creative arts or the performing arts would always is always going to sort of be in, in the background for me. So I guess I would work in probably television or, um, you know, film production or something like that, I would say. I'm glad to hear you share that. You know, I, I started um, my undergrad in my teens um, in communication design, and that's where um, typography kind of really became important for me. And it, that kind of infuses a lot of my work today. So, you know, that kind of education that you get in your formative years really shapes you, doesn't it? Yes, definitely. Um, number 12, what would you not like to do in terms of career? I think what I would uh not like to do is maybe work at the tax office because because really i have so much problems doing my own taxes i just don't understand it <laughs> so maybe that's something i don't want to do is work at the tax office so that might be the only thing really nice um number 13 what's your favorite word quote or sentence oh wow okay um Gosh, uh, um, so I'm gonna, yeah, I, I, <clears throat> I have a few, but I honestly don't, I, I don't have them off, uh, off the top of my head. But I would say that one of my favorite quotes, which is actually a bit of a cliche is, uh, don't look back, you're not going that way. Mm. And uh, it's something that uh, I heard really a long time ago. And uh, actually recently I've seen it on a t-shirt even. And I was quite surprised because uh, uh, it was just, actually this was when I transitioned and went to, uh, to India. And uh, I thought, okay, I'm going to, maybe, maybe teaching is a good thing. And uh, 
I saw this somewhere, you know, don't look back, you're not going that way. And I thought, ah, yes, go forward. It's all right, go, go towards uh, go towards this because this feels, feels like a good thing. And it was the best decision I ever made, especially for the next part of my life, which is now and, uh, and teaching. Yeah, I think that that would be it. For, nice. For that, uh, Great. Um, number 14, what's your least favorite word quarter sentence? Uh, my least favorite word is normal because I don't know why someone would say, well, you know, could you be a bit more normal? What does that mean? Or are you, is this normal? So I think the idea of normal uh, is very individualistic. And so I don't like the word normal because I think there are different uh yeah, they're, they're just different definitions of what normal is in society, uh, in, you know, in generation, in uh, culture, in country, in language. I think that this means different things to different people. So I don't like it being, I don't like it when it's used to define whether something or someone or a situation is out of the ordinary. Great, I like that one. Um, number 15, if you had to pick one word to describe yourself, what would it be? Uh, connectivity, I like to connect with people and uh, I really love, uh, <clears throat> um, what, I, what I love about being a lecturer is the connection I have with the students. So um, I would say that that is the most interesting thing about my job is the connection you have with people the way you relate to people and the world at large and, uh, and the understanding uh, you bring about. And um, uh, I, I can't say that I'm particularly an extrovert, but what I do like is I do like the ability <clears throat> to connect and to connect honestly. So yeah, connectivity. 16, what keeps you up at night? Mm. Mm. Well, I, uh, well, uh, to be quite honest, what would keep me up, what's, what did keep me up at night for a while until I saw her was my mom because she was aging. And usually any, something that would keep me up at night would be more emotional, more family oriented. I would not be kept up. At, I'm not going to stay awake for something work related. Um, but uh, I would say that, you know, something that has to do with family, but now that I've seen her, I'm, I'm more restful. So, and I know she's okay because she's aging and I wanted to see that she was all right in South Africa. So I would say that that's something that would keep me up at night, but not much more than something that has to do with family. That's great. That's the first time I've heard a, a kind of a personal angle as a response to that question. That's great. <sighs> Um, number 17, what's a dream you're chasing? I want to do my PhD. Oh. That's the dream I'm chasing. Um, I never thought I wanted to do a PhD. It was not something, uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, the funny thing is that I, I'm, I'm not really very interested in pieces of paper. Um, but well, here I am now. I mean, I, I did a research master and, uh, so I, I, I do have, I am allowed to do a PhD in the Netherlands. And so this is the current dream that I'm chasing and I'm about to write a proposal for it. So um, we'll see if that happens. I'm particularly interested in exploring whether technologies like blockchain technology can be a driver for uh, increasing awareness and social sustainability and what would that do for us uh, in the industry. Uh, so would it's uh, and, and how visible uh, would it would that make it for uh, for the industry and for for, for people at large? So um, we'll see. But uh, yeah, to be continued. I want to do a PhD too. I was wrestling with doing the PhD research proposal, and uh... it is a wrestle, isn't it? I I feel you. I uh, I know what you mean. It's. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a big, it's also a big commitment, right? Yeah. Okay, final stretch, number 18, mm. what inspires you? Mm. What inspires me? Gosh, uh, ooh, uh, I would say, um, I, I would say what, what inspires me is, ah, so um, I like to read and 
uh, and, and I mean, I, I, I like to read uh, fiction. So, um, uh, and, and this has nothing to do with, with my work. And I love, I love words. So what inspires me is the book that I'm reading at, uh, and I can be very, you know, sometimes I can get into a book and be very engrossed in it. And it doesn't necessarily, it usually has nothing to do with sustainability. Although I have read some really amazing books that, uh, you know, the, the, that touch on, on subjects like sustainability, because of course it's a big thing in society at the moment. So what inspires me usually is the book that I'm reading currently and I'm in the book in, in the moment. And um, I would say something else that inspired me recently, which I which was also a book um, uh, that I read uh, more than 20 years ago was um, a book by um, Eckhart Tolle, and I think it's called A New Earth. I always get confused whether it's called A Good Earth or A New Earth, but that's not the point. But uh, in the book, he talks about being in the present moment. And for me, that's very inspiring to, to be in the moment and to enjoy the moment that you are in, instead of thinking about where you want to be in the future or what you've done in the past, but just trying to explore where you are right now and how that makes you feel. And that was quite an inspiring book for me. Great. Um, any advice you'd like to share? Mm, I would say, you know, uh, do what you love, you know, life, life is too short not to do what you love. Uh, and I know that we don't all that have that luxury, I, I think it's actually it's a little bit elitist to say do what you love, but I do think, you know, try to find in whatever you're doing, try to find some, a light point, try to find something that you can enjoy, because I would hate to, to think that, uh, that we would have, anyone would have to go through an entire life on a daily basis, not enjoying what they do. So uh, and especially for young people that are out there that are listening to this, um, you know, follow your, yeah, follow your heart and, and, and follow, follow what you want. And uh, maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but money is really not important. It's, you know, you're not going to take it to your grave. So, you know, do what you like and enjoy it. Of course, pay your rent also, but, <laughs> you know, do what you love. I like it. And number 20, um, how can our listeners keep tabs on you? How can we follow you? Um, how can we start to think about looking at your research? What should we do here? Uh, yeah, so um, uh, you can uh, definitely um, connect with me on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, you can also follow me uh, on uh, Instagram. Um, and on Instagram, I have my, uh, uh, my account, uh, my um my personal account, which is Mary Nisha Munilo, but I also have my professional account, which is Mare and Moon, M-E-R and Moon. Um, and I think those are, and, and uh, on LinkedIn, I usually put up anything that I'm, uh, you know, that I'm doing or um, uh, any papers that I will write in the future. So yeah, um, let's stay, stay in touch in that way. Um, and uh, probably uh, you can always, and, and definitely if I, um, if I get a place to do the PhD, it will be on LinkedIn. So you'll be able to then uh, follow my research there. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Marinisha. Um, you know, so great to hear about um, your lecturing, um, you know, your research um, ambitions, um, your, your bold um, strength in sustainability and fashion, um, you know, so much richness there. Um, and so glad to have you on the show. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks for having me. It was lovely to talk to you after all these years. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much. Thank you.